The A team makes one cup of coffee last five hours, will not be seen at this time, so that we may bring you this special program for people who have time on their hands and nothing better to do. Hey, hey everybody, what's up and welcome back to Macabre Gorium Labs presents the School of Boredom Nickelodeon Edition. My name is Bats and today we're going to give you a compilation of all five of our Nickelodeon guidebook volumes in one video. They were originally intended to be one video, if you watched volume five, you've seen that. But, we broke them down into smaller bite-sized pieces so they'd be easier for you guys to process. But, for you hardcore Nickelodeon fans out there like me, here is volumes 1 through 5 in their entirety. We'll check back in after the video. We'll begin today's episode with a historical look at Nickelodeon's beginnings as a kids network. Before delving into the shows on this network, we feel it is important to understand the way Nickelodeon became a channel and how it grew into what it is today. Here in the terrible year of 2020, most kids watch or are at least familiar with Nickelodeon. But have you ever wondered about how this channel came to be? Well stay tuned because in this school of boredom we're going to drop some history on you. Back in the 1970s, television was not what it is today. There were only a few network channels, such as CBS and NBC, which back then you could tune into without paying for cable. That's right, if you wanted to see local television stations, you needed something called rabbit ears that you'd put on top of your TV. Ask your parents. If you did have cable, it was extremely expensive for not much more content, and most people didn't or couldn't have it. Also back then, the idea of paying for basic TV was not the norm like it is today. Back on December 1st, 1977, QUBE, which was an experimental cable TV system, was launched. The QUBE, or Cube, service brought people 30 channels, including 10 pay-per-view movie channels, 10 broadcast channels, and 10 community channels, with the 10 community channels being offered at no additional charge. Now the community channels included one specifically for Pinwheel, airing each day from 7 to 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Pinwheel was a children's TV show on Cube similar to Sesame Street. It was on channel C3 of Cube's cable system in Columbus, Ohio. When the channel moved to national TV in April of 1979, it was renamed Nickelodeon. Although Pinwheel did continue to air reruns up until 1990. In 1979, Warner Cable bought Sat1, the communications satellite, and rebranded Pinwheel into Nickelodeon. Pinwheel was reformatted as hour-long episodes seen in three to five hour blocks. This format would eventually serve as a model for Nick Jr. According to its history, Nickelodeon was used as a loss leader for its then parent company, Warner Cable. Now, for those who don't know, a loss leader is a product sold at a loss to attract more customers. For example, a grocer discounting a hot dog bun, but then raising the price of hot dogs. The company thought that having a commercial-free children's network would help cable systems become more in demand, helping them rise above their rivals such as HBO. Although people did pay to have premium channels like HBO, they looked at that as paying for movie channels, not for TV. Nickelodeon was created by Dr. Vivian Horner and Sandy Cavanaugh, with the official launch being on April 1st, 1979. Nickelodeon is an American basic cable and satellite television network that is part of the Nickelodeon Group, which is a unit of the Viacom CBS domestic media networks. Now this division of Viacom CBS focused on TV for children and teenagers. Today it has expanded to include three spin-off networks in the U.S. and has six international channels in six continents. Nickelodeon, the first all-kids network, was originally going to premiere in February of 1979. 
However, the premiere was pushed back until April 1st of 1979 and was shown on Warner Cable franchises across the United States. Now most television networks had logos and Nickelodeon was no exemption. Matter of fact, their logo used to look like this. The logo was designed by Joseph Lawsey with the letter font by Lullaben Smith and Carnasse Incorporated. Sorry if I butchered any of those names. Lawsey had seen the word Nickelodeon as a good idea for the name for the channel. For those that don't know, a Nickelodeon was an old-fashioned coin-operated machine that played music, such as a player piano or a jukebox, so it fits in nicely with the idea of a kids-only network. Warner Cable CEO Gus Hauser chose Lawsey's proposal from a list of 150 names. Some of the other contenders were the Savoy Channel and the Rainbow Channel. I don't know about you guys, but I think they made the right decision. With name and logo on point, they immediately jumped into the advertising and commercial campaign. Lawsey also worked on the advertising campaign. Joseph Lawsey wanted to take out the old man peering into the Nickelodeon logo and replace it with his son. So he dressed his son Joseph, Lawsey II, in knickers, a British flat clap, and suspenders, had him looking into the Nickelodeon logo. However, due to time and new management, the Nickelodeon redesign was never shown. Nickelodeon was well received and expanded quickly within the Warner Cable system, both across the country and eventually being picked up by other cable providers. The initial lineup for Nickelodeon included video comics, Pinwheel, America Goes Bananas, Nickel Flicks, and By the Way. All of these shows originated at the QUBE studios. Originally, Nickelodeon was a commercial free service. Instead, they ran interstitials between programs. In television, an interstitial is a short program that is shown in between movies. For example, when you see cast interviews or short cartoons after movies on channels like HBO, Showtime, and other premium channels. These early shorts primarily consisted of a mime, Jonathan Schwartz, doing tricks in front of a black background. Nickelodeon, innovative, non-commercial, cable television programming for young people. Kids are finally getting the kind of television they deserve. Picking right up where we left off in Volume 2, Nickelodeon's original programming aired from 13 hours a day, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. On weekends, there was an extra hour of programming shown running from 8 a.m. to midnight Eastern and Pacific Time. This probably helped out parents a great deal too because it meant their young ones could stay awake an hour longer, usually resulting in them getting an extra hour of sleep in the morning. Star Channel programming would come on after Nickelodeon's broadcast day ended. On September 14, 1979, American Express would enter into an agreement with Warner Communications to buy 50% of the company for $175 million in cash. Due to this joint venture, which was finalized in December of 1979, Star Channel and Nickelodeon became part of Warner Amex Satellite Entertainment. 1980 brought a new lineup with Dusty's Treehouse. We got it backwards. The tail's upside down. Yeah. Let's try it the other way. Now, don't get excited. I'm not getting excited. Okay, we just take our time. First row features. <laughs> Special delivery. What will they think of next? What will they think of next? Tonight, from Japan, a wonderful new way to make jewels from junk. A new x-ray system that looks at a broken... And live wire. Then, in 1981, they decided to introduce a new logo design. 
It was a disco ball overlaid by multicolored Nickelodeon text. Then on January 2nd, 1982, children's television was forever changed by Nickelodeon airing one of my personal favorite shows, You Can't Do That on Television. This was a Canadian sketch comedy television show featuring kids acting out comical skits. In addition to being hilarious, this show also brought us Nickelodeon's iconic green slime, which would later be adopted into many of Nickelodeon's hit shows. This show became Nickelodeon's first hit series, and the two are always thought of together. Think Saturday Night Live, but ran by children instead of adult weirdos. However, we'll be covering that in its own School of Boredom lesson in the future, so keep an eye out for that. The best way to just do that is to click subscribe, like this video, and turn on notifications so you can see all of our cool Nickelodeon and other School of Boredom stuff as soon as it comes out. This included the future game show Double Dare. Some of the many shows during those early years included The Third Somewhere Eye. in the crowd, sometimes you find someone very special. Someone who hears the unheard. Stand by. Lights. Camera. Action. And Mr. Wizard's World. Do you like bananas? Oh yeah, I really like bananas. Well here, have one. Let me get it started for you so it's easier to peel. Here. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Then on April 12th of 1981, the channel changed its broadcast schedule to a new 13-hour schedule broadcasting between 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. Eastern and Pacific Time. The Star Channel had become its own 24-hour channel by that time. Due to that, Nickelodeon gave its off-hour space to the Alpha Reparatory Television Service, or Arts Network. Arts eventually became Arts and Entertainment Network, or A&E, in 1984. Also in 1984, Warner Amex Satellite Entertainment spun off Nickelodeon and two other channels, MTV and RTS, into the newly formed MTV Networks in order to make more money. In the beginning, times were tough and Nickelodeon had to struggle a bit with a loss of 10 million by 1984. This was due to the network not having a lot of successful shows that captured viewers' attention. Nowadays, it's hard to imagine Nickelodeon being last in the US cable channels, or any channels really. The management staff was fired, and Fred Siebert and Alan Goodman were tasked with reinvigorating Nickelodeon. Their company, Fred Allen Incorporated, teamed up with the advertising firm of Corey McPherson and Nash to rebrand the network. Then on October 8, 1984, Nickelodeon changed its logo to the orange-colored balloon font we all know and love today. This logo lasted for 24 years and 11 months until September 27th of 2009. Fred Allen Incorporated also worked with animators, writers, and producers to come up with the variations of the Nickelodeon logo, including the orange splat we love. The October 1984 rebrand proved to be very successful, because within six months Nickelodeon became extremely dominant within the channels of children's programming. The rebrand also enabled Nickelodeon to accept normal advertising and it promoted itself as the first kids network. Nickelodeon remained on top for 26 years, even though other networks began to pop up, such as Disney Channel and Cartoon Network. In June of 1985, Nickelodeon became a 24-hour network. Although some cable systems didn't have room to air a new channel, General Manager Geraldine Laybourne was tasked with developing programming for late night and overnight time slots. Geraldine got help from Seabert and Goodman who originally thought up a classic TV block beginning with over 200 episodes of The Donna Reed Show. So anyway, picking up where we left off on Volume 3 on July 1st of 1985, Nickelodeon officially launched Nick at Night, which would air from 8pm to 6am Eastern and Pacific. Around this time, American Express decided to sell its shares of Warner MX, to Warner Communications, Warner Communications turned MTV Networks into a private company and sold MTV, RTS, Nickelodeon, and VH1 to Viacom for a whopping $685 million. This was the end of Warner's venture into children's programming until they bought Cartoon Network in 1996. 
Another interesting thing that Nickelodeon brought to us happened in 1988. In an effort to get kids more involved, Nickelodeon created and aired the Nickelodeon's Kids' Choice Awards, or KCAs. This enabled kids to see that their votes counted, as they could now vote on their favorites in television, movies, and sports categories. Not just about winning. This is the biggest party of the year. The list of guest appearances is fantastic. What's up, New York? During this time, Nick Jr. was introduced, and it would replace the pinwheel block. It contained educational programming for preschool and kindergarten age children. On June 7th of 1990, Nickelodeon Studios opened, and it was a hybrid television production facility and attraction at Universal Studios in Orlando, Florida. It is from these very studios that many of our favorite sitcoms and game shows were filmed. Nickelodeon also entered into an agreement with Pizza Hut to provide Nickelodeon Magazine for free at the chain's restaurants. Moving on, we come to August 11th, 1991, when Nickelodeon would premiere its first original cartoon series. Now this is where Nickelodeon gets really good, because we were introduced to Doug, Rugrats, and the Red and Stimpy Show. As well as the Nicktoons name. Originally, Nickelodeon was not going to produce a weekly cartoon series due to high production costs, but had to reverse their plan, and oh boy are we glad they did. Nickelodeon was gaining even more popularity, and on August 15th, 1992, they extended their Saturday programming by adding a new two-hour primetime block, and they called it SNCC. SNCC would air from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. on Saturday evenings and would feature such shows as Are You Afraid of the Dark? and Clarissa explains it all. Now don't worry guys, both of these shows will be featured in a future School of Boredom lesson. However, this block would later become rebranded as Teen Nick. Teen Nick still runs to this day, but wasn't officially branded from 2009 to 2012. During that time, the Gotta See Saturdays brand was brought to the Saturday morning and Teen Nick primetime blocks. Once again, picking up where we left off, we gotta go back to the past. In June of 1993, three years after the last issue, Nickelodeon started the Nickelodeon Magazine as a pay subscription. Nickelodeon Magazine began coming out again in June of 1993. In March of 1993, they asked for help from viewers to help come up with new shapes for their new logo. The logo could be any shapes or design, but was required to have the iconic orange logo. Some of the designs chosen were a cap, a balloon, a gear, a rocket, and a top. In 1994, Nickelodeon introduced The Big Help, where kids could learn about helping the environment and helping out in their communities. Kids could call into a phone number and get a chance to have one of their local parks restored. You're looking mighty green today, world. And I mean that in a good way. Ah, uh, thanks. I like green. And I guess you're not the only one. Looks like big helpers all over have been busy greenifying by planting trees and cleaning up parks. In 2008, this was changed to the big green help and taught kids about global warming. Unfortunately, in 2009, Nickelodeon stopped showing episodes of You Can't Do That on Television after a 13-year run. However, they did start airing episodes of All That. All That is also a sketch comedy show with kids, and it ended in 2005. But it was brought back with a whole new cast of kids. In 2005, Viacom split into two companies in order to deal with the ever-changing industry. 
Both companies would be run by National Amusements, Viacom's parent network. In December of 2005, Nickelodeon, the MTV Networks divisions, and Paramount Pictures were on the new Viacom. The original Viacom was changed to CBS Corporation and had CBS, Showtime Networks, Paramount Television, and CBS Television Distribution. Also, unfortunately, in 2005, Nickelodeon Studios was closed down and turned into the Blue Man Group Sharp Aqua Theater in 2007. Nickelodeon's live-action series were then moved to the Nickelodeon Sunset Studios in California. Seema Zeragimi became president of the New Kids and Family Group. This group is responsible for bringing us many of our favorite networks, which include Nickelodeon, Nick at Night, Nick Jr., Teen Nick, Nicktoons, TV Land, and CMT Pure Country. They can't all be winners. In 2009, Nickelodeon decided to change the network noggin and turn it into Nick Jr. Nickelodeon debuted a brand new logo in July of 2009, and this was the first time that happened since 1984. This enabled Nickelodeon to diversify its audiences and give a more customized lineup. The new logo was used for branding and revitalizing new shows and networks. The new logo for Nickelodeon will also appear on all end credits on all Nickelodeon shows. This logo was even used on episodes before they actually launched it officially. The logo turned into a blimp prior to the 2010 in 2011 Kids' Choice Awards, as the award itself looked like a blimp too. In October of 2009, Viacom had gained the rights to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and added them to the lineup by buying it from the original owners. Now of course you know we will cover Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in an upcoming lesson. Prior to 2011, Nickelodeon's programming affected all children's networks by dominating the market. However, in 2011, ratings began dropping as the Disney Channel became a pretty strong contender and didn't start to come back until 2012. The network started making TV movies like Legends of the Hidden Temple. Legends of the Hidden Temple. Rocco's Modern Life. Why don't you go back to the 90s where you belong? Yeah! And Invader Zim, just to name a few. You gotta order a million pizzas, and then I gotta roll around in them pizzas, and that's the story about how I turn into a giant pizza. In October of 2018, a person named Brian Robbins became president of Nickelodeon, replacing Seema Ziragami. During her time, she brought us great programming for 33 years. Netflix and Nickelodeon had signed a contract to make a whole bunch of movies and TV series based on their long list of characters. This was done in an effort to have better ratings and in an effort to compete with Disney+. In 2019, Viacom merged with the CBS Corporation to form Viacom CBS, and they continue to bring us new and funny shows today. This merger enabled CBS to add content from Nickelodeon to the all-access streaming service. Now here in the terrible year of 2020, Nickelodeon is going strong and still bringing us quality programs to this day. Although most shows won't be as successful as Spongebob Squarepants, he will be discussed in a future lesson as well. And with that, we come to the end of the video. We hope you enjoyed this Macabre Gorham Labs School of Boredom Nickelodeon Edition Nickelodeon Guidebook Volume 1 through 5 in their entirety. I've been your host, Bats, and hopefully you'll come check back next time because you never know what will be creeping up behind you. As usual, think for yourselves. Keep it creepy. Nick, 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 Hey, thanks for checking out our video. If you'd like to see more content from us, click this link right up here. If you'd like to check out one of our partner channels, you can click this link right over here. Either way, we hope you click subscribe and like and check us out for more content and don't forget to turn on notifications.